Hi, this is the third instalment of Metalhead. The backstory, I suppose, if you want to call it, as to why Yasan Grigorovich became an assassin and his early life in the USSR. We just found out that he had been asked by Scorpia to kill a man called Scar. And we also learned that Yasan Grigorovich did not do his job for patriotism. He did it simply because that's what he was, that's what he'd become. Um, and hopefully by the end of this story, we'll find out a little bit more about him and the organisation of Scorpia. Scar was not a pleasant person. Born in the Ukraine, he'd become a senior figure in the Russian mafia, born before he'd branched out and started his own criminal organisation. He was a weapons dealer, selling everything from machine guns to guided missiles, and on one occasion he's actually started a war in order to sell his products to both sides. To amuse himself, he operated a major pipeline from South America, bringing drugs into Europe, and he was also involved in blackmail, extortion and vice. It was uncertain how many people Scar had killed, but it was hardly surprising. He'd buried some of the bodies and discovered others, dissolved others, in sulfuric acid. He'd got homes in New York, London, Hong Kong and Moscow. His collection of cars, including a Bugatti voiture noire and an Aston Martin Valkyrie, were said to be worth over £100 million. No criminal gets to be as rich or as powerful as this without making enemies, and Scar could have filled a football stadium with people who would have liked to see him dead. I did not know which of them had joined together to pay the £250,000 that my service would demand, but this wasn't my business. I examined the information on the computer screen. Scorpia had done their homework. They provided me with everything I needed to know where and how to kill Scar. It was not going to be easy, and that was reflected in the high price I was being paid. The man I had just finished off in South Africa had been a low-level businessman who'd recently returned from an elephant safari. The fact was he'd been hunting and shooting elephants was completely irrelevant and was not, I think, the reason he'd been chosen to be killed. But all the same, I think it did give me a certain satisfaction to push him off of the 26th floor of a hotel building where he'd chosen to stay. The murder had cost just £100,000 and I'd economised by not using a bullet. Scar was very different. He seldom went outside his homes, which were actually more like fortresses, and when he was moving between them, he always travelled in a convoy surrounded by bodyguards. He used bulletproof cars and private jets that were jammed with sophisticated defence systems. The staff employed to protect him outnumbered him. Oh, numbered 40 people, ex-soldiers and mercenaries, and it amused me to read that he'd also got a personal food taster, and all I can say is that left a nasty taste in my mouth. He'd got a second wife in New York and a network of friends in other parts of the world. It would be impossible to get to him. They were terrified of him. The first wife had given an interview to a newspaper without his permission and he instantly dissolved the marriage. Then he dissolved her. He had no children. When he ate out, the entire restaurant was closed down so that he and his friends would be alone. He took holidays only on private islands. Scar was almost untouchable. Almost. It interested me that even though he was undoubtedly very clever and careful, he still had a weak spot. Did he really think his enemies would not learn about that and use it against him? Or perhaps he was just getting careless as he grew older. He was 49 years old. It was my job to make sure he didn't reach 50. His weak spot was the opera. He loved going to Covent Garden in London, the Metropolitan Opera House in New York and the Bolshoi Theatre in Moscow. Of course, he was careful. He never sat in the stalls or the dress circle. He chose instead a private box where he could surround himself with protection officers who'd sit very close to him, forming a human shield. He never told anyone he was going until a few moments before he arrived. That way it was impossible to plan an attack. If there's one truth in life, it's that criminals can never trust anyone. They've got too many men enemies. They're hated for too many different reasons. They're victims, friends, families and people who fear they're about to become victims. There are business rivals and perhaps worst of all, admirers. The admirers want to be like you and the best way, best way to do that is to get rid of you. Many great criminals have been killed by their deputies. In a way, it's quite flattering. Someone in Scar's organisation had leaked the information he was going to be at the Bolshoi Theatre for a performance of The Queen of Spades by the Russian composer... Pichor Ilyich Tchaikovsky. It would be a rare moment when he'd be out in public and it surely be possible for a concealed sniper to fire a single shot that would end his business career and his life. I was to be that sniper and I knew there'd be challenges. Smuggling a gun into the theatre itself. I'd have to shoot him when he came out but first I'd have to spot him in the crowd. Almost certainly he'd be wearing a bulletproof vest under his dinner jacket. He'd be surrounded by his entourage. I would only have one chance. 
even so I was sure I could do it. The very next day I flew to Moscow, travelling in coach as I always do. I can afford business or first class, but why would I want to draw attention to myself? I checked into a cheap hotel and dressed like any other tourist, visiting Russia's capital. I made my way to the theatre that dates back to the 19th century and I might have been impressed by the main entrance with the 16 white columns holding up the front portico and the four horses pulling Apollo's chariot above. But I was not impressed. All I was thinking was that there were buildings close by, nowhere I could hide to wait for the performance to end. The front of the theatre faced a wide, empty square. If Scar came out this way, I, could, I would be unable to reach him, even with a weapon such as a Macmillan Tac 50 sniper rifle, which can kill from a distance of two miles. It would be too dark, I wouldn't have enough time to find him. However, the secret informer inside Scar's world had given us further information. We knew the number of the box he'd be sitting in during the performance of Queen of Spades, and looking at a map on the theatre, we'd pinpointed the nearest exit. Unless he wanted to cross the entire auditorium, which would be a risk in itself, Scar would come out onto Petrova Ulitsa, a narrow street that ran next to the theatre with a huge department store on one side. This also made sense as his limousine would be waiting for him and he'd have far less ground to cover. No more than ten steps. It would be a gamble, but I checked with my controller at Scorpia and it was agreed I'd take up my position here and wait for him to come out. For some reason he chose a different exit, coming out the other side of the building, we just have to wait for another opportunity. And so at around six o'clock I found myself in the TSUM department store, pretending to look at clothes, the jewellery and the best of everything that Moscow had to offer. I'd got a guitar case across my back. It's funny how often I use musical instruments to hide my weapons, but in this instance it would work perfectly. People would think I was a musician at the Bolshoi, perhaps killing an hour before the opera began. It wasn't that time that I was killing, and the guitar case did not contain a guitar. It was easy enough to make my way up the sixth floor of the assume and find a service stair that led me up to the roof. It took five seconds to open the so-called security door. If I'd been in charge of the department store, and for that matter the opera house, both heads of security would have been fired and sent to some distant location for retraining. It was a cold evening but dry and cloudless, and I was wearing thermal underclothes to keep me warm. I was using an FR F2 sniper rifle manufactured by Nexter in France, which had been modified to fit inside the guitar case. I'd also got a Sagan Sword 3-in-1 sniper scope, which had been used thermal imaging to light up my target as he stepped out. Now all I had to do was wait. Waiting in my profession is easy. I've been taught the meditation techniques that would allow me to relax completely, indifferent to the slow passage of time. You might say I was as stone as, as the cold statues on the Bolshoi. Although there were street lamps, it became quite dark once the department store had closed. Few people walked down the street. Occasionally I heard snatches of notes from the orchestra performing in the building opposite. At about ten o'clock, I realised that the Queen of Spades must be coming to an end. A few taxis had turned up and parked and there were some also private limousines. I recognised the ones with the bulletproof windows and the tyres that couldn't be shot out. These would belong to VIPs in the audience. They would all want to feel protected, particularly in a country where wealth and power became a fast invitation to death. Then I heard the slow eruption of applause and the shouts of bravo and encore and the performers took their curtain call. I picked up the rifle and looked through the scope, perfectly balancing myself on one knee. The sniper and his weapon are one. This was something that had been drummed into me by Scorpia, but if you've never killed anyone, it's difficult to explain. Let me put it like this. The brain calculates, the eye sees, the finger pulls the trigger and the bullet flies. The target is hit, the target dies. These are not separate events. They're organic, they're whole. This is what it feels like to be an assassin. The moment I've been waiting for had arrived. There were at least half a dozen doors along the side of the theatre and they all opened at the same time. Suddenly the audience was pouring out into the street. Hundreds of people making their way for taxis and limousines, simply drifting into the night. Many of them were wearing black tie. We are very formal at the opera in Russia, more so than in Europe. Women wear long gowns with jewellery sparkling in streetlights. Moving quickly, but not with any sense of panic, I swept my sniper scope, searching for my quarry, and I knew that Scar would not be difficult to find, assuming he'd come out this way. I'd seen photographs of him and committed his face to my memory, the bold head, the flabby cheeks, the squashed nose that looked as if he'd just been punched. I found him, there he was at the door, and I'd almost gone past him because he was surrounded by bodyguards. They were moving in a cross formation, one man in front, one behind, one on each side. 
He was wearing body armour and the target was small, some distance away and completely obscured. For a brief moment, I was annoyed with myself. A grenade launcher would have been more effective. Of course, it might have killed 10 or 20 people, but would that matter if Scar was one of them? He moved to one side, and although I could see part of his shoulder, his head was still invisible to me. His car was perhaps 10 paces in front of him, and I knew I'd got no more than 15 seconds for the kill. I tensed myself, trying to find the right moment, and then it happened. A man came out of the theatre at the same time as him, dressing a suit and a loud tie. I recognised him instantly because even though it was a million to one chance he should be there, it was Metalhead, Igor Krokov. There could be no mistaking him. The beard, the barrel chest, the hair that had turned grey, but still only covered one side of his head. His eyes were red as if he'd been crying. Perhaps the opera had been too emotional for him. But as far as I was concerned, it made him look more devilish than ever. His jacket was stretched tight over his chest. He seemed to be alone. Despite myself, I felt a surge of hatred rising in him. It was critical for an assassin to remain cold and emotionless. But sometimes you never forget the things that are done to you at 13. And I vividly remembered the moment in the examination room when he'd taken the mass paper and uttered my name, knowing that he'd got the power to destroy me. I saw him in the forest too, laying into Ilya with his belt. I'd not seen the mother since I'd left the village, and I doubt that things would have ended well for them. And then a terrible thought came into my mind. Kill him. Why not? Scar was nothing to me. He was just a job. And anyway, I didn't have a clear sight on him. He was too carefully concealed by the group who were being paid to protect him. It'd be easy to explain to Scorpia that no opportunity presented itself. And although I knew only too well they never forgive failure, in this case they would understand. How then would I explain the death of a civil servant? I could tell them he'd stepped in the way at the last moment. He was, in fact, very close to Scar, not near enough to touch. And there was nobody obstructing my aim to him. I'd got only five seconds to make up my mind. Both men were moving across the theatre, across the pavement and towards the road. I couldn't see Scar, but I knew where he was. I knew I couldn't hit him with a direct shot. What if I was to shoot Croc off first? The crowd would scatter in panic. No, I was kidding myself. As soon as the shot was fired, his bodyguards would close in on him like a rugby scrum and bundle him into the car. It was one or the other, but which? Three seconds. The car door was open. The two of them were already moving apart. Still no clear sight of Scar. I couldn't see his face. Despite the cold air, I could feel a trickle of sweat draw a line down the side of my face. I made my decision. I curved my finger, gently stroking the trigger, and I aimed. The effect was immediate, like dropping a stone into a bucket of water. Even before people knew what had happened, the entire crowd seemed to ripple outwards. And at that last moment, it was Igor Krokov whose head had filled my sniper scope. And the bullet had blown him off his feet, sending him spinning backwards. People began to scream. A short distance away, bodyguards had frozen. As professional as they were, they were paralysed for a brief brief seconds, looking for the enemy, wondering where the next bullet might come from. I turned the sniper scope back on them and watched as they came into the terrible realisation of what had just happened. Scar was standing in the middle of them. Even he was unsure who'd been killed. He'd been hit in the neck and there was a trail of blood leading down, soaking to the white collar of his shirt. As I watched, he tried to take another step forward, but his legs caved in beneath him and he collapsed and lay still. Although he had been my target, it had been impossible to shoot him while he was surrounded and I couldn't see him. I had thought I would have to give up, but then I realised there was another way. Making an instant calculation, I'd adjusted my aim and shot Krokov, aiming for the thick metal plate that Soviet surgeons used to save his life. I worked out the angles. The bullet hit him, continued its journey, ricocheting off the metal and travelling sideways into Oscar Theodore Droksky's neck. Metal head was hurt badly, knocked unconscious, but he would live. The mafia boss, already dead. As I packed away my equipment and left the roof of the department store, I was happy. I'd accomplished my task. My employees would be satisfied and I would receive the full payment for my work. At the same time, I realised that Krokov was nothing to me and I would have gained nothing by killing him. I just hoped I'd given him a headache that would last for the rest of his life.